So a big hello and a very, very warm welcome to all the participants who've been uh, patiently waiting, many who are joining in right now. A warm welcome uh, to our webinar series. We have continued this series very well and I have been enjoying this series, the series which is focusing on increasing the awareness related to pacifier protection increasing awareness on matters related to compliance and some things which are fairly generic. Uh, it, is, it is an awareness uh, campaign aimed at bringing a common understanding of a very key aspect related to fire safety, uh, which is simple to understand, not just by engineers, but by architects, by lawyers, by government officials, um, so that something which is very basic uh, as it has been going on for a long time is brought to an understanding for everybody. As we all know and see that fire safety becomes more and more and Im more important. So a very warm welcome to all of you signing in from different parts of the world and joining me today. I would start with uh, asking you to please familiarize yourself with the controls. At the bottom uh, of your screen, you would see uh, almost icons. If you click on them, you can open the question and answer uh, window. Uh, I would urge any questions that you would want to type uh, or ask, uh, please type in these questions in the question and answer uh, window. You also have a chat window, uh, which you can open from below. And you're most welcome to uh, type in questions or type in remarks, uh, which will not be recorded. So if I don't address them, uh, I cannot go back and look at them. So if you can't hear me or if you can hear me or, or anything uh, that is an informal conversation, please feel free to uh, type it up. Um, like all the other sessions, this webinar is being recorded. I have my uh, good friend and colleague Ruben hiding behind uh, and making sure that the record button is clicked. Um, on some slides, actually, there is just one poll session that is planned for today. And I would urge all of you that whenever you see this uh, blinking icon, please be ready to answer the poll questions. Um, I would also like to uh, share that before I start the webinar, that uh, just in case uh, there are some errors or omissions during today's session, uh, they are unintentional, and I hope uh, my colleague uh, Sujana from the Reaction to Fire Lab is also logged in and hiding somewhere to correct me in case I go wrong. Um, a lot of you may already know me. My name is Abhishek Chabra. I have been uh, your host, and uh, you have seen my name across the screen in uh, emailers coming to you. Um, I'm a big enthusiast of compliance and conformity and, uh, and uh, really enjoy talking about this and, and increasing awareness. So a quick introduction. Um, the company I work for, Thomas Bell Wright International Consultants, has been around for over 25 years. And 25 years ago, we started mainly as a curtain wall test lab or a laboratory where uh, contractors will come and build mock-ups. They will build mock-ups of uh, their uh, curtain wall systems, and these curtain wall systems can then be validated for air infiltration, water infiltration, and various design elements related to facades and curtain walls. About a decade ago, uh, or more than a decade ago, we ventured into doing fire testing, uh, starting with just one reaction to fire test, which was the Stein Eternal test, as well as one uh, resistance to fire furnace, which was three meters by three meters. Today, over the last seven years, we've expanded uh, many, many fold. Uh, we have a slew of reaction to fire equipment, which I will talk about today. Uh, we have uh, one of the largest fire related mock-up uh, rigs. Uh, we test to the British standard, the BS8414, the American standard NFPA 285, uh, as well as another American standard for perimeter fire barrier uh, called the ASTM E2307. We also have four uh, fire resistance uh, furnaces, making us probably one of the largest uh, fire testing laboratory focusing on passive fire protection 
in this region. So today uh, we talk about uh, a very simple subject, probably complex for many people, which is a reaction to fire testing. And this is extremely important for everybody who is listening and probably would be listening to this session later uh, because something which is as simple as uh, whether something you have in front of you will catch fire or not catch fire. And it is um, extremely important for all of us to be specific, to be uh, talking about this subject in a quantifiable way. This is a fairly easy approach. Somebody comes with a piece of product or a material and you want to check, does it catch fire or not? And maybe you have a cigarette lighter or something and you say, oh, it catches fire. Uh, that's easy enough. Some of my friends here uh, like to take a slightly drastic approach. They would come with a blowtorch and, and say, oh, look, this is burning or not burning. I've seen a lot of videos. I'm sure you have too. But the um, important part is that we understand that there are several properties which are important and which are critical to be referred properly when we talk about reaction to fire. And it is not just about whether something will catch fire or not catch fire. We are talking of extremely large number of products, materials, systems, which are important to be validated and quantified in terms of how much will they or can they contribute to a fire that may grow to be a very, very big accident. We are all familiar with the fact that it is common to have saying whether a matchstick drop on a carpet or uh, electrical spark happened in a junction box. But it is important to understand for designers, for architects, for engineers, for builders, for authorities having jurisdictions, and even the common person to know and understand that how to prevent a small fire incident becoming a big fire accident. Many of you may have heard uh, the terms like spread of fire, fire load, smoke, um, ignitability, and there are a slew of words which would define uh, what really happened inside an office or an apartment or a building where a big fire tragedy might have happened and how it could have been prevented. We aim so that today's aim is to arrive at a common understanding uh, between the engineers, the lawyers, the architects, and everybody else to be able to speak the same language, understand the same concepts, and make sure that whatever we do in our, in our work lives or, or otherwise uh, will always prevent a big fire to happen. Now the challenge um, exists when someone is designing an interior of uh, an office or a restaurant or a hotel or a mall or a residential complex or a commercial complex. There is a, there is a big motley of products, materials that come in. More often than not, a lot of these products and materials are custom designed for a given type of occupancy. How do you really make sure that you draw the lines and create borders saying, well, anything used here should be this, anything used here should be this? Because when you come to a fire testing lab like us or any other, we would give you a test report which looks something like this. And uh, very often, um, you know, writing in a, in a technical specification or a law saying, well, the PCS should be 3.0 millijoule per kilogram or less, only then any material is allowed in or not allowed in. So today's aim is to not only arrive at a better, better understanding of what is really the reaction to fire uh, of various products and materials, how this is quantified, tested, reported, and then how is it that authorities having jurisdiction, building controls, 
contract writers uh, can really define this in easy terms, something like that you see at the bottom right of your screen, a simple table, which would say A1, A2, B, C, D, saying anything that is A2 is allowed to be used, let's say on the roof or the wall or so, and, and almost help us in arriving at this better understanding. So today, as we delve into this uh, aspect and a better understanding of this, I would want all of you to start uh, with imagining uh, a few building materials. And this could be, let's say the table where you're at, or maybe a cardboard box or a garbage bin or uh, or the false ceiling or the curtain or the sofa or anything that's around you and keep these five, six different products, different materials in your mind. You can add a piece of paper, even a pen, which is which could be a metal or a plastic pen and keep these things, these objects, these products, these materials at the back of your mind. And as we go through uh, different tests, different properties, try and imagine what if you put this product or this material under this test, what will really happen? And because if you do this, it will really help you arrive at an understanding which, which you can keep as a reference in your mind. Because as we design, as we build, we use an extremely large motley of products and materials. And we need to understand that what can happen, how uh, fires, which could be a small fire, can grow to be a very, very big fire. And as we have to maintain our houses, our offices, and there is a big fire or a small fire, we cannot always call Thor to come and say, okay, quickly extinguish the fire for us. So I'll take a small step back and I'm gonna talk about fire protection uh, almost as a revision. A lot of you may have seen these slides if you have attended earlier webinars or sessions, but I want to bring back uh, everybody on the same page to talk about uh, where does reaction to fire sit in when someone is preparing a fire and life safety plan or someone is uh, trying to look up and make sure that any property, any occupancy is protected against fire. So for example, the small video that is uh, running at the top left uh, shows a small fire that started near the kitchen of this imaginary uh, house or, or, a, or a condo that I looked up, um, <clears throat> does not really grow and, and spread. So there are two main methods which have been used around the world, around uh, governance mechanism, contractual mechanism, building code mechanisms to make sure that fires do not really happen. One, all of you, some of you know, is what is called an active fire protection system or products or materials that activate in case they smell or sense or see a fire. And these could be smoke uh, detectors or visual alarm systems or heat sensors that would activate either an annunciator or an alarm or a hooter or, or send a message to the civil defense close by or just activate a sprinkler system to make sure these products activate and control a fire. On the other hand, we have a lot of building materials, products, whose inherent property passively create a construct to make sure that a small fire incident does not become a big fire accident. And this, something which I covered last time as well, the resistance to fire, which ensures that fires, when they happen, they are contained inside a compartment uh, inside a floor, inside a section beyond which the fire doesn't grow. And along with this is also something which is today's subject, which is a reaction to fire. What is this reaction to fire? We talk about reaction to fire today as four uh, different groupings. And these are four properties, four parameters or four groups of parameters, which are um, often used uh, to quantify the behavior of products, materials, and systems in order to arrive at a better understanding 
a better scheme, a better forward plan to make sure that a fire does not happen. So anybody who is designing uh, an interior finishing or even an exterior of a building and, and keeping in mind certain materials that can be chosen, um, a very good understanding of these four uh, properties uh, will help you arrive at making sure that a big catastrophe does not really happen. So let me begin with uh, ignitability or ignition. And this is a very simple property and it should be all looked at separately from all the other properties that I'm talking of. So let's you know, just try and imagine uh, the, the piece of paper, the cardboard box, the plastic rubbish bin, the false ceiling. Um, and imagine that if there is a constant environment around you of pressure um, and the temperature is increasing, which is the ambient temperature is increasing, you would know and understand that there are some products or materials that can spontaneously catch fire. I don't remember the exact temperature, but paper uh, usually has a very or a relatively lower threshold that uh, when the ambient temperature goes beyond, I don't know, 100 degrees or something, I don't remember, uh, it will spontaneously catch fire. So how do we quantify this for being able to be used in contracts, in, in technical regulations? And, and I start with one of the tests, which is uh, typically used for plastics, uh, which is the ASTM D1929, this is a test that we do. And uh, what the D1929 does is that it uses a, a hot air furnace and it tries to arrive at a specific quantified number saying at this temperature, the product or material that has been put to test uh, will spontaneously ignite, which means ignite on its own, or will ignite with the help of an external flame or an ignition. So what the test method does is that we take the samples, we prepare them, and, and we maintain a constant temperature in the hot air furnace. And we could probably start at 300 or 400 degrees, and we keep on increasing the temperature, and, and, and we kind of try and figure out that what is the exact temperature at which the product or the material will spontaneously catch fire. This is a test method which is mainly used for plastics or even uh, materials which would contain uh, plastics. The result of such a test is typically two different temperatures, uh, which is the spontaneous ignition temperature or what is called the flash ignition temperature. And uh, uh, some of the other um, variables are also uh, observed and noticed, some of which you can see on your screen. And uh, these variables are often used for people who are designing uh, or making sure that they use this test data correctly. Another test which is also used to define ignitability, uh, often called the Bunsen burner test 11925-2. And this test is used as part of a larger classification mechanism, which I will talk to at the end of these slides. Um, this test um, uh, is a fairly simple test. You can see the equipment. It has a, almost like a flame or a burner. And at the bottom right, you can see the samples uh, which have been tested. And some of you may notice a kind of a line or a marker on it. So what this does is that it measures um, the spread of flame on a sample um, by using across its vertical surface. Uh, and, and we impinge uh, the edge or the surface uh, with an application of a, a match sized flame for a duration of uh, between 15 to 30 seconds. And then also uh, what is noticed is that does this limit of 150 millimeters as a line get crossed by uh, the rate at which the material catches fire or ignites itself. Uh, the 11925 um, looks very, very different as a method as compared to D1929, which is a very specific test for uh, ignition temperature of plastics or ignitability of plastics. Um, but more on how this is used uh, towards the end of this. Next, 
I talk about combustibility. And uh, very often, um, combustibility as a property um, gets interchangeably used by certain other properties, which I am going to talk about. Um, but for us to, before we delve into an understanding of this test, um, you should try and imagine a, a composite material or a material like maybe a, a gypsum board or the a PU foam of a sandwich panel or the, the core of an aluminum composite panel or any such material that would have some organic compound in it, which is that part of uh, the material which will burn for sure. We know that it is an organic uh, material that will burn. It could be a coating, it could be a varnish um, and some material which will not burn and we know it will not burn, uh, which could be uh, some sort of a non-combustible material or something that will not catch fire. It could be silica, it could be stone, it could be metal, it could be one of so many things. And the reason I want you to understand and imagine this is that because for any product that does burn, there might or might not be some residue left. So what is left is something that did not burn at all. And what gets burnt um, is, is the almost the net weight of what is combustible. And uh, the reason why I want you to think about this is because I want you to imagine these materials and it will help you towards the later part of this session and, and imagine why we are talking of combustibility. So by definition, combustibility of a material is defined as an exothermic reaction, something that produces energy or releases heat with an oxidizing agent. And uh, it is typically characterized by these three properties, which we try and quantify in one or actually all of these three test methods, which are written in green, which is the heat release, which is the amount of energy that is released and the behavior, you know, is there flaming, is there glowing? What is getting emitted? Is it emitting droplets? Is it emitting smoke? So this specific test method, which was 1182, or even the ASTM 2652, or the ASTM E136, which is part B, what this test does is that we have a vertical tube furnace, which is maintained at a temperature of 750 degrees Celsius. And as the temperature is maintained and stabilized, uh, the specimen is lowered. You can see uh, a specimen on the bottom right corner of your screen, which is before and when it is loaded into the equipment and when it is just brought out burning. Um, and this is lowered in and kept in, in this vertical tube furnace. And we assess the mass loss, the temperature rise, and if there is sustained flaming of the material to arrive at quantification of the property of combustibility. And mind you, this test is only done for any product or material which is homogeneous in nature and not something which is non-homogeneous. Again, the way the test is reported um, comes across as many of the reaction to fire tests, which is a motley of properties that might not always be easy to translate into a law, into a contract. And, you know, we talk about uh, the temperature rise or the delta T, what was the mass before the test, what was the mass after the test, and, and, and various observations. And hence, how much of the material will burn, um, or what is the material, or what is the component that will burn away, uh, and how it gets translated and is written into specifications is something that we will talk about later. But the test, as a test result, uh, in this situation is mainly used for someone who is trying to design a material or trying to design a product which will eventually comply to certain regulations or requirements that has been set in. Moving to my favorite uh, parameter, which is calorific value. And it is my favorite because it always reminds me of the calories I have been putting on and taking on. And there is usually a very good um, analogy to try and understand and remember 
what is it that we are talking of here when we talk of calorific value? So imagine a box of sweets, which uh, one of my colleagues is supposed to hand me over and I'm still waiting for that. Um, so imagine a box of sweets and you try and imagine um, halawa or, or something which has a certain sugar content. And that sugar content is something um, that you need to be conscious about uh, for understandable reasons. So exactly in the same way, um, what is the calorie content of any building material, which could be a, a, a composite uh, sheet or a block or a coating that is used for, I don't know, for the fall ceiling or the wall, um, is that value or that uh, amount which is going to burn and produce uh, uh, the heat of combustion. So what the test does is it's a, it's, we have, I think this is the bomb calorie meter, if I remember correctly. So the bomb calorie meter um, uh, puts in a sample of a definitive size and um, the test calculates the heat of combustion or the potential or the calorific potential of the material. And by virtue of this test method, by uh, completely burning the sample inside the bomb or the test equipment the way it is, uh, and arriving at what is the thermal energy produced, measuring the thermal energy, and defining at the absolute calorific value of that material. So a test specimen of a specified mass is burned under stabilized conditions at constant volume uh, in an atmosphere of oxygen, uh, which is inside a sealed uh, bomb calorimeter. And when it is completely burned, the amount of energy it releases heats the water jacket and then the delta temperature is measured. And based on that, on, based on a calculation, the heat of combustion, which is the amount of heat energy that is produced uh, is quantified. And hence we arrive at the gross color calorific value of the three tests that we do. And this gets reported again in, uh, in, in something which might not be straight away used in uh, a technical document or a contract, but it is important to understand that what is the property, how it gets reported, and then now in the subsequent slides, we will see that how these properties get uh, utilized in specifications. But with this almost basic understanding of three or four properties, three properties, we now arrive at what is usually a resultant property or something that is measured uh, in order to quantify the behavior of, or selection, the, uh, quantify the behavior of materials based on the spread of flame on the surface or the amount of smoke that is released. The ASTM E84 test as an example, as well as the European norm of the 13823, uh, which is much more detailed in arriving at uh, the fire growth rate, the total heat release, the smoke and droplets behavior. Both these tests arrive at trying to quantify how much flame gets spread over the surface of the material. These tests are often used uh, to define and create limits of building materials that can be used in, uh, in finishing or in such areas of the building, which can possibly carry a fire to a distance. And how it actually does is that we all know that any product or material has constituent elements or components which have a defined ignitability. They have a defined calorific value they have a defined combustibility. And when all of these products and materials are brought together into a resultant system, there is a net arrived property of how quickly a flame can spread on the surface and a fire can 
quickly propagate either from one part of the room to another or one section of the building to another just because that product or that material has a higher concentration of combustible constituent elements or higher calorific value constituent elements and the density of these constituent elements is higher or lower. You could imagine a, a designed um, insulation material, which could be a PU or a PIR foam or any other such material, which by virtue of the properties it has to create, like uh, thermal conductivity or low thermal conductivity, uh, water resistance, climate resistance, sound resistance, it would have certain products or materials that will catch fire. And when people are designing these materials, mixing one or two products and, and components to arrive at balancing of the high combustible content um, would arrive at a material which uh, would have a lower flame spread. So how this specific test work, the ASTM E84, is that it uses two reference materials, a calcium silicate board and red oak wood to arrive at four reference points. The calcium silicate board has a flame spread index and a smoke developed index of zero, zero. And on the other hand, you have the red oak wood, which has a flame spread index and a smoke developed index of 100. So if you imagine that when the red oak wood burns, the rate at which it burns and the amount of smoke it produces is 100-100. Now, any other product or material, which could be a plastic, a composite, a mixed material, a coated material, when it is burnt in the Steiner tunnel or this test equipment, relative to these two numbers, a number is arrived at. So you can almost imagine that certain types of plastic, which burn faster than red oak wood, would have a flame spread index number much higher than 100. So the result of such a test is uh, uh, usually bland looking, saying, well, the FSI and STI is 109, 950. And typically this number may not really make sense, uh, but is this number is used by creating classification of ABC, and I'll come to that later, and, and then used to create demarcations of the types of products or materials that should be allowed for a given application or should not be allowed for another given application. Similarly, the uh, 13823 as a, as a test method um, quantifies these three uh, values, the fire growth rate, the total heat release and the smoke and droplets. The test specimen as you can see in some of the images on your screen, is installed um, in such a way that uh, it represents the corner of a room. And that's the reason why sometimes this test is called the room corner test. And it is mounted on a trolley where we have a, a meter and a half by a meter as, as the big wing as well as the small wing. And the corner of the room uh, or the corner of the test specimen is subject to a a 30 kilowatt uh, fire, if I remember correctly, which is conducted um, um, for, for, I think the test is conducted for 21 minutes. So the combustion of the gases, as well as the rate of fire is analyzed. And what we arrive at is again, a series of uh, test results. Um, I talked about FIGRA, which is the fire growth rate, uh, the SMOGRA, which is the smoke, um, growth rate, the total heat release. And these are quantified as absolute numbers, but these quantifications are then later used uh, to arrive at classifications. And I will talk about these classifications as soon as all of you answer this poll question, which I'm gonna open for you. And I'm gonna take a quick uh, water break and I would like you all to answer this uh, poll question quickly for me. I hope all of you have this poll popping up on your screen and I'm gonna wait for you to start answering these questions.
very simple basic questions uh, gives a very nice and a good feedback about uh, whether i'm doing good i'm um, being able to explain this right or not I see some people have started asking questions. I'm going to try and reply these questions and see that towards the end of uh, today's session, if I can open the floor and uh, people who have asked some questions, I may open the audio if required for people to answer these questions. Meanwhile, I'll encourage all the participants and people who are in the um, who've logged in uh, to answer the questions, and and the ones who are probably busy doing an email somewhere and. and trying to see, okay, this webinar is going on. Please come back to the screen and answer to these poll questions so that I know you are here. All right, so I'm gonna let a few of you finish off these uh, poll questions and I'm gonna uh, focus at explaining how these four properties of reaction to fire are practically used in specifications, in contracts, in building codes, um, and how these properties are able to create demarcations based on applications. The property of ignitability, as explained, is usually a very absolute clear property because we are talking of a temperature at which any product or material uh, can catch fire. So for example, this material, uh, which is the core of uh, cladding material as required by specifications in the UAE Fire and Life Safety Code have set up a limiting criteria saying it should not catch fire at uh, 373 degrees. Now, it's a very flexible, very usable uh, property and it is used effectively by specifications uh, in contracts of several applications people who may be coming up with uh, a manufacturing location, a residential area, uh, places where you know that beyond a certain threshold, a temperature could trigger something. So any product or material uh, that can catch fire at that temperature is not allowed. Uh, and hence, this property is relatively easy uh, to use. The properties of calorific value and combustibility and are, are two such properties which are often used to arrive at classifications or arrive at some uh, nomenclature that would create compartments or buckets of materials that can be allowed or to be used. Let me start with uh, talking about flame spread index, which is this uh, number which comes out of the Steiner Tunnel Test ASTM E84 or the UL723. And what this test does is, as I said, it reports an absolute number. And how do you really use this number? Well, people who understand the test and understand how the relative uh, behavior of material or material of behavior relative to red oak wood is uh, quantified as a number would come up with a mechanism like the International Building Code came up with a classification mechanism that it created class A, class B, class C, and, and, and then hence defined the use of anything for an interior wall or a ceiling finish material that this material should be class A for such and such application, class B for such and such application. And hence, um, like a lot of people who do this test ask us, the test method uh, would rarely say whether the product is passing or failing. The test method in itself does not talk about a classification. It just reports an absolute index number and it is uh, contracts, building codes, or other such documents which would arrive at a criteria of pass or fail. There are uh, criteria, I think, in the HVAC industry where we talk about um, something called 2550, which is the flame spread should be 25 or below. 
and the smoke developed should be 50 or below. And any product or material which uh, aligns to 2550, not a classification, but just 2550, uh, is allowed to be used in a given application. So the quantification, hence, uh, helps in writing contracts, writing technical regulations, which then can very easily allow you to quantify the liability, define the responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So in, in a very uh, similar way, the test methods, which I talked about earlier in the European uh, norm, uh, which is the EN 13501 as a standard, which helps uh, writing the classifications of materials. So based on the tests conducted, and, and we talked about this, these test methods earlier, 1182, 1716, the single burning item, 13823 and 11925, the results of Smogra, uh, Figra, uh, all of these, they are tabulated into a simple form, which I'm not showing on the screen. I can send it to you in an email if you want. But what it does is it produces something like this. This is a simplified tabulation created based on the results of various specific properties of ignitability, properties of calorific value, properties of combustibility uh, defined and, and arrive at an index saying, uh, A1 or A2, which is non-combustible material, class B or C or D or E or F, as well as quantify the smoke uh, as S1, S2, S3. You can see this on your screen. Uh, and, and it quantifies, let's say, the droplets behavior. And an amalgamation of data from so many different tests is brought about to create a, a very simple um, method that can be used to define uh, quantification. And this leads to um, a very, very important and critical part of the whole process, which is using this knowledge, using the understanding of these tests, the test reports, the classification mechanisms, and where exactly are they used? These are used by people who are designing, designing buildings, designing infrastructure, but not just that, it's used across the course of the construction industry, right from designing to building to furnishing, as well as people who have occupied and, and are living in different types of occupancies. Because it are these classifications, which are based on core properties, are used to set the requirements. They are used to set the regulation based on past learning saying, anything which is class B, if used as the ceiling finishing material, could be risky in a commercial application or a residential application or so on and so forth. And hence it becomes very important to understand uh, what are the means of conformity, how conformity is needed uh, to be put into contracts, to be put into technical laws, which could be written by authorities having jurisdictions, and, and also define what is the liability if you break the contract. Because we all know from the images that we have seen, from the reports that we have uh, read through about massive accidents that happen based on small fire incidents, which could have been prevented if people designing those buildings, those infrastructures, people who were specifying materials, people who were buying these materials, using these materials in the construction, as well as maintaining these occupancies. If they had used the right terminology, the right classification to clearly define what should be used, what should not be used, and not just clearly define, also define the methodology by which it can be checked. It can be specified. The subcontractor who may not understand what is the heat release ratio, but should understand that the product is certified and listed to be class A2S1D0 as an example, without getting bogged down into how it gets achieved. 
but it is an important exercise to know how quantification is done and how these different conformity mechanisms of testing, certification, inspections uh, are used in, in reality. Because knowing these uh, properties, understanding these properties needs to granulate into correct use of classification based on past learnings, based on codes, based on the contractual documents that are written, because we need to define this to not just the manufacturer who would have uh, tons of R&D people writing and defining and arriving at fitting their products or materials into a given classification based on the properties of ignitability, combustibility, et cetera. But also for the contractor who needs to procure bespoke products and materials and install them into specific occupancies and make sure that when we read what are the requirements that have been written by the fire consultants or the, by the authority having jurisdiction who would say that this classification is not really allowed in this location. So while all of this is very easy to assess <clears throat> using my favorite topic of all the webinars, which is certification and listing and go look at the listing, it's not always very easy to do <clears throat> for finding this out for bespoke designed materials. And this is where a different methodology of compliance <clears throat> is used, excuse me, um, where the specification requirement, which is coming from the building code usually, defines what the compliance should be to let's say a specification of class A, B, C, or A1, A2, and one of several criteria that you have today understood and can be used in the contract, which you are placing as the contractor, which you are writing as a specification writer, and defining in the contract that the subcontractor uh, needs to ensure this. And the methodology of ensuring is specifically for bespoke materials, because more often than not, the interior finishing is bespoke, is to pick up a sample from the construction site, get it tested in the laboratory, and create traceability that yes, these 15 coated uh, samples which were built in or brought to the site, uh, two out of these are picked up and sent to the laboratory. And these are not only tested uh, with the correct marking of traceability, it leads to uh, a testing report, a testing report against which an inspection can be done at the construction site. And hence, you close the loop of creating an assurance mechanism and also keeping a record or a trail that yes, this was asked in the contract and here is the proof of assurance. So this brings me towards the end of today's session. I hope uh, the session has been interesting learning for you. I'm gonna take a 30 second break and I'm gonna read the questions and take them one by one. All of you uh, are most welcome to write in any questions in the question and answer screen and I'll try to answer them one by one. <clears throat> so I'm gonna try and answer some of these questions. Um, I don't know if I can. Uh, the first question is, what is the difference between flammable and combustible material in testing? And um, I may not be able to answer this very well. I'll try. Uh, in, in, in reality, flammable means anything that burns releasing a flame. Uh, and it is important to quantify what the flame should be or should not be or how much the flame should be. But anything that will catch fire and produce a flame is a flammable material. Again, combustible material is any material which has um, almost like organic compound or some part of the material which will burn 
and the net mass will reduce combustible material does not define the heat release of the material it just defines how much let's say in the net volume of the whole product has certain part which will burn and combust and release certain heat which could probably ignite something else or which could cause another catastrophe and that is where the calorific value total heat release these parameters become important as well as critical i hope that answers your question but please feel free to write further in case you think this is not answered um this session will be recorded and uh, will be uploaded on our youtube page uh, you're all welcome to look up our youtube page uh, it has all the recordings of the past webinars as well as this webinar will be recorded and uploaded on the youtube channel hopefully by sunday um at which testing category sealants and gasket mainly fall of that we may specify a material that can be allowed or listed uh, to be used for facade uh, external application combustibility um i think mustafa what you're trying to ask is uh, is what is probably the requirement in the uae fire and life safety code and that i don't remember off hand but i can i can come back to you uh, on a phone call and explain what the current requirement is when it comes to the classification uh, of the sealants i do know that for sealants in gaskets uh, there is a new understanding that has been arrived at that to arrive at the classification as per the european norm of en 13501-1 um, a method of testing them has been agreed at where instead of trying to test the sealant or the gasket as per the single burning item test or the spi test by loading on to a 1 meter by 1 and a half meter um test rig uh, we just test the the smaller portion of uh, the test uh, so we line up almost like a gasket and i'll come back to you on that on a phone call uh there is a question which says hi abhi i don't know the question um let me take two more questions uh as we come closer to today's session can you suggest combustible test for rock wool products well we can test rock wool for combustibility as per the tests that we talked about earlier today which are the tests specifically for what is uh, combustibility and uh, we can tell you how much combustible content a sample of rock wool has like these questions which come from anonymous attendees i think i should stop giving the option of anonymous questions so there is a question i'm going to read out uh, i hope my voice is clear and you can drop me a line if i'm not clear specifying a1 and a2 products for use is all well and good and straightforward the problem comes when the bs8414 tests which allows combustible products as part of the system to be used surely this points to the bs8414 test being flawed um i'm not very sure that the bs8414 test is flawed uh but probably the bs8414 test is not being used and interpret correctly and um and i have talked about this in in several other uh webinar sessions and i would welcome you to look and in here them earlier as well the specification of a1 or a2 and sometimes even class b which is allowed as constituent material for a cladding system to be allowed provided they can comply with 
a large scale test like an 8414 or an NFP 285 or any such um, bases all of this on the premise that the fire consultant or the fire consultant and the facade consultant have a good and a thorough knowledge and understanding of the potential risks of, an ex of a given facade. We all know and understand that any facade system that is designed for a building would have a few dozen or a few hundred drawing details. And all of these drawings typically point to several combinations of materials and components coming together in different proportions. And the risk assessment needs to be done right here. The facade fire consultant or a mix of both need to go through all these drawings and understand on the basis of the properties we talked about today, which is ignitability, combustibility, calorific value, and arrive at a risk assessment saying, which are those sections where those materials are coming together whose ignitability, combustibility, calorific value can interact with each other and create a potential fire hazard. And this is what needs to be used to arrive at a mock-up. The mock-up need not be an exact replica of a section of a facade. The mock-up needs to represent one or several such fire uh, risks or, or designed sections of the facade where the fire exists. And such a test when done as per the BS8414 or any of such large scale tests would then arrive at a good understanding that is the design methodology, is the design good? Is the fire risk of a combustible or an ignitable material being balanced out by a design element so that even if the fire does happen, it is controlled from increased propagation. I hope that answers your question, uh, but I would love to take a call from you. Please feel free to write an email and I'd love to have a conversation. So there is a question related to need more info regarding certification after testing. The testing facility is not necessarily a certification body. That is correct, Barry. A test report only gives a snapshot of how the specific sample behaved as part of the test. Certification body is the body that uh, makes sure that the manufacturing location has a uh, production control mechanism and facilities that will show repeatability of the result of the products that they are producing. Okay, a few more. I like these questions. What should be the temperature of a non-fire side of a typical services penetration? I will not answer this question, Abbas. I don't know. Uh, what is a typical services penetration? It depends on occupancy. So I'm sorry. What is the main difference between the UL723 and an ASTM E84 test? Uh, the tests are almost exactly the same, except for those kind of plastics which drip or can potentially drip. And hence, um, the UL723 allows uh, or, or takes this into account and reports the flame spread index uh, in a different way because it can happen that when the sample gets tested in the Steiner tunnel, the dripped uh, fall off uh, of the sample, which is a type of a plastic, forms a pool at the base of the test equipment and can reignite because of spontaneous combustion and give an additional uh, ignition to the sample. All right, so this is the last question.
uh, by Manish that in the last slide, mention is correct, but how to ensure applicator has done the installation properly in passive fire subject, especially in doors and partitions. And that's a fantastic question. Many regulations, many contracts, uh, and many jurisdictions make it mandatory to have a qualified inspector, a third party inspector, which will do an inspection of all passive fire installation. This includes fire doors, this includes internal finishing materials, this includes fire stopping, et cetera, et cetera. I hope that answers your question. And I will uh, finish the session today at exactly one hour. Thank you very, very much for all the attendees. And I look forward to seeing you again, hopefully next month. Thank you very, very much.